Hello and welcome to episode 155 of Ready to Mosh. I'm Jen G and with me as always, the 45 to my 59, Mr. Kev P. Uh, no, don't know what you mean. Stunned you into silence. Yeah. yeah. They're just gaslight on them, numerical references. Oh, right. Okay. Because that's part of today's episode. Yeah, I wouldn't have got that in a million years. I didn't expect you to. It was just off the cuff. Didn't think in advance. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. So it's time to round up July. Already, it seems like two seconds ago since we were at download at the start of June. I know. I don't. What's happened? Where's the time gone? I just feel like I've spent the last month just recording and recording and editing and editing. Same. It's, it's that time of year, isn't it? Yeah. Where it's festival season, we've got the usual stuff to get on with, we've got to do stuff more in advance because we've got more festivals to go to, and it's just all a little bit crazy. And inconsiderately, there's your birthday to work around as well. Doesn't matter. That's fine. It does. No, I'll just sit in a corner and get hammered. I'm yeah. all right with that. A beer cast on your birthday, a bonus episode. Maybe, yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's an idea, it actually. Is. Yeah. Anyway, we're rounding up July. Slightly different kind of roundup to normal, as in we've got the usual bits of news, although it has been quite a slow news month, I think. Again. Obviously, we've got the podcast roundup because that's existed. Mm-hmm. Review-wise, we've actually got a live review, which we wouldn't normally do within the roundup, but we had no kind of room There's to no do it gaps. as a separate yeah. episode, and it was a gig that only I went to anyway, so it's going to be probably a short one because it was a little while ago as well, so it was, yeah. who knows what I'll remember. We have got an album for you, though, as well, and three singles. So no idea what length of an episode we're about to record. Knowing us, we'll say it's going to be a short one, and then we'll waffle on, and it'll be some kind of marathon-sized one. But yeah, here we go. Let's round up July, starting with news. And the most recent one, I think, is that Gajira played the Olympic opening ceremony on Friday night. That was a fucking random decision. Yeah, they announced it a couple of days before, didn't they? Yeah. I was quite excited by it. Oh, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's great that Gajira played it, but it's just such a... Not that it's a strange choice to have them play it, but it's a strange choice that you don't usually see a metal band. Well, they're the first metal band to do it. And the funny thing is, as well, obviously the Olympics has been in many other countries. Mm. Goes without saying, really. But many other countries that have got more kind of prominent and bigger metal bands than France. But France yeah. chose to do it with what I would say was their biggest metal export. Unless I've missed something obvious. I can't think off the top of my head what's, who's bigger than Gajira that French. Well, there must be somebody, but I can't think. Not metal, though. Mm, maybe like a crossover. I mean, they were there in the company of Celine Dion and others. Oh, yeah. Well, she's Canadian anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think the nearest thing I can recall to that was Frank Turner did the 2012 opening ceremony, didn't he? Yeah. But it was it was Frank Turner, not Mongol Horde, though, wasn't it? Yeah, so yeah. more kind of alternative than metal in the song that he did, I guess, and that type of Frank Turner, if you know what I mean. And the closest I can think is Sabbath doing the Commonwealth. Yeah, they did, didn't they? Birmingham. Yeah. But that kind of makes sense as they're from Birmingham. Yeah. And there's not been a bigger export. <laughs> not really, <laughs> not no. Not from Birmingham than Black Sabbath. And funnily enough, we, I popped it on anyway, just out of curiosity around about quarter past seven, I think it was, on Friday night. And it was just timed perfectly for when Gajira's it was, yeah. track was on. So we didn't watch a lot of the opening ceremony and we didn't have a drinking game like we did in 2012 <laughs> and yeah. probably nearly died. Probably why you're so averse to shots. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just happened to put it on just before Gajira played. So that was great. And it was kind of, the Marie Antoinette segment of the opening ceremony, wasn't it? So they actually played a French revolutionary song, Ah Sa Era. Probably mispronounced that as always, but it was really cool. I'm sure most people have seen it anyway, but they were kind of up in the windows of a building with lots of fire and lots of redness on in the background. And obviously, to follow that, we now have the return of some satanic panic from metal being on such a worldwide scale. Yeah, Like they're a band that sings about trees and whales. Yeah. <laughs> As metal goes, they're not the most satanic band that could have performed there. You know, if the Olympics go to Poland and Behemoth play, then you might have a point. But yeah. that's not happening. <laughs> that's so. not happening any time soon, no. Not the Behemoth. But, but, yeah, yeah, Poland I hate, but he... Yeah, so... <laughs> anyway, it's good to see that, wasn't it? Mm. 
then the other one that's been doing the rounds is Tenacious D kind of postponing everything, cancelling everything after Carl Gass's comments about don't miss the president next time and something along those lines. Which kind of it kind of irritates me the whole thing around that because when it was said, it was obviously not planned and it was a spur of the moment thing that he said. So obviously, you know, it would have caught people off guard. But the people who were at the show didn't give a shit. No, and it's funny that it was in Australia as well, wasn't it? It yeah. wasn't like he was on American soil. Yeah, it's not it. like he was in Alabama or Arkansas. Or it's... Yeah, it wasn't, well, maybe it was an immediate security threat for the rest of the band. I don't know, because you know what people are like. But Yeah, but the people at the show just didn't give a shit. They thought it was quite funny. And essentially, I think it feels like all that's happened is that Jack Black has protected his own interests mm. because he makes more money doing other stuff than he does with Tenacious D and has got to try and distance himself. But it also feels like he's just hanging his mate out to dry. Yeah, it does a bit, doesn't it? Really? It just reads but... a bit, yeah. I mean, it's just, it feels like it's shitty behaviour from Jack Black for not supporting his band member or his bandmate. Yeah, they're supposed to be like best friends, aren't they? And it's like, mm, you just wouldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, maybe he's waiting for the whole thing to kind of die, die, die down a bit. Because I think it's only like, te- is it temporary that they've kind of cancelled no stuff idea. or is it permanent? I don't know, but maybe they're waiting until after the election and see how the land lies there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that could have something to do with it, but I feel like it's just, it's protecting his own TV and movie deals. Kind of wants to be as far removed as he can from it and then it doesn't affect his income. Yeah. Well, that's just how it feels. Yeah, it's a shame really because they've obviously just made the kind of comeback again haven't they so yeah. after quite some time but yeah and i just i don't give a shit so i, I would expect that kind of behavior from tenacious day and smaller bands have probably said things along the same line it's obviously just they're a high higher profile band really aren't well, they yeah. there's been other bands that have made even stronger comments so i don't yeah i don't get it Next up, just a little funny little thing that happened over the last few days, and that was My Chemical Romance's Facebook page got hacked. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the profile photo got updated and some kind of new posts Weird got posts. put on, but that, that were a bit odd, but it got fans all excited thinking they were back together once again. But it turned out, and the band confirmed it, that the page had just been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's such a random choice as well, isn't it? I just might have a romance to randomly have the page. Yeah. Page act. Yeah. Odd. Someone was bored. But what also does me about that, as we know, kind of like Facebook, Instagram, everything's all intertwined. Yeah, that's true. So why was it only one that got done? I don't know, actually. They are kind of linked, aren't they? Yeah. Better, but I guess Facebook's more of a, a written thing where people could put on kind of posts and stuff, whereas Instagram's photos. It's more visual. You know I mean? And final bit of news, Queens of the Stone Age have cancelled more live shows after Josh On needs more medical care following surgery. And so they cancelled dates in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, France, Netherlands, Belgium and Portugal. So that's kind of like them probably done for the year now. I think so. I don't know what they've got planned beyond that. I don't know. I don't know if the plan was to go back to America and do some more shows there, but effectively... All the European dates are cancelled, so they'll just stay back there and probably not do anything for the rest of the year. Probably try and reschedule for next year, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it for main bits and bobs of news. It's been sprinkling of tour announcements, but nothing that we're overly excited about. And obviously there's been some Bloodstock kind of news and announcements, but that's all included in the Bloodstock preview episode, number one and number two. So we'll move on to the podcast roundup. So, attended. Gem 3, Kev 2. Mm. So I went to Gaslight Anthem, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a minute. Yeah. We both went to Mangata Festival and we both went to see Thrasher Wolf and King Abyss, all of which have reviews in previous episodes. So go back and listen if you haven't already. Booked, not technically booked as such, but we have had our attendance at Bloodstock confirmed. Yeah, we're going to be there again, don't we, media? Yeah, we'll definitely be there. Merch Perch, Kev 2. Gem 1. Yeah. Oh, actually, it's technically more than that, isn't it? If you think about today. Oh, yeah. So, technically, Kev 3, Gem 2. Yeah. So, what we actually have physically purchased, Kev got a Mangata t-shirt. I didn't because I didn't have my size or my backup size. We both acquired a King of t-shirt from the Mansfield show. 
yeah, I've been after that T-shirt for a while and saw that they got it there, so decided to get those. And we have just pre-merged. Pre-merged? Pre-merch could be a thing, okay. kind of, technically. We've pre-ordered our Stone Dead merch. Yes. To collect on the day. Yes, what's that? Two T-shirts, cup? T-shirt each and the plastic cup with a line-up on because we haven't got enough plastic cups already. Yeah. Only a whole kitchen cupboard full of various plastic <laughs> cups. From various festivals, ice hockey games, arenas. football matches, yeah, just arena stuff in general. Maybe we should do a giveaway. Yeah. Would you like to have a cup that we've used? <laughs> you. It, would be, it would be washed, obviously. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, well, we might think of a reason and do a little giveaway. Okay. Or maybe we should just make our own, our own merch. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Put a sticker on it. Yeah. And finally, as always, reasons for Gen 2 mentioned Ghost. They have released animated videos for Mary on a Cross, which you will have seen if you've watched the Ghost movie, which is currently streaming on Veeps, I think, for the next few weeks for the bargain price of about $20 or something. What? I suppose if you didn't go to the cinema to see it, it's only the same as a cinema ticket and you can watch it. I think you get to watch it for a week if you purchase it. Mm. So, yeah, anyway, they've released that. And also Future is a Foreign Land, which is the kind of end credit track of the movie that's also got an animated music video as well that's been released ahead of the soundtrack to the movie, which was released on the 26th of July, which is obviously kind of the live show that you see in the movie, minus I think about six tracks have been taken off. For no particular reason? or So it would fit on vinyl primarily. Oh, right, obviously okay. you've got a limit on the vinyl, and I think the tracks that have been taken off are ones that have, well, they, obviously there's more than those, but ones that were on the last live album that they did in, I think that was 2016 or 2017. And they need to get it down to that amount of tracks because they need to make more money. Exactly, and just to be out <laughs> on vinyl in various different colours. So. But I've been enjoying listening to that over the last few days, especially on headphones. You really just get all the different layers of the vocals and stuff. So that's been good to listen to. And I won't mention Ghost again for the rest of the episode. Mm, we'll see. Now we're going to move on to Gem's Gaslight Anthem review. And it was a gig that you went to with a friend. I did. And I didn't go because I didn't want to because I don't like Gaslight Anthem. No, you bought me the tickets for my birthday. And I think the wording that came with them was, I bought you these, but I do not want to go with you. <laughs> Under any circumstances. So then I had to find someone who did want to go with me. Yeah. And to be honest, I'd kind of half forgotten that the gig was coming up. So it was all a bit last minute. Mm. But it was fine. I had a gig buddy. All worked out well. And I could have gone on my own. Would have been happy to do that. But I had the two tickets. Yeah. So. Yeah, that that was the reason I didn't go. I, just, I don't like Gaslight Anthem. And said to you, I don't want to go. Just take anybody you want. I did drag you to a Brian Fallon solo gig a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. And, and well, after after that, I'm just like, I'm done. Mm. If I'm not interested in the band, I'm not going. Yeah. I don't mind buying you tickets, but I'm not going to be there. To be fair, I, I, I'm okay with going on my own to things these days. Mm. I've done a, a couple of things recently on my own. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I'm the same. Like, I went to the Soul Asylum gig, didn't I? You did, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm more than happy to just randomly go to anything on my own. I don't care. So anyway, back to Gaslight Anthem gig. How busy was it? Very. Very. Was it sold out or Rock City sold out? Well, it was sold out. If anyone who doesn't know Rock City, there's sold out and there's Rock City sold out yeah. because when they sell out, they we feel, obviously, don't want any libel claims against the building, but we feel it oversells yeah and we don't want to sound like those people who complained about download being oversold last night last night last year but yeah you can kind of tell yeah you you can tell there are times where you i mean you physically can't move you walk through the door and that's it you're kind of stuck yeah it was busy when i got in there and because i was up on the balcony anyway i'd not got full comprehension of how busy it was downstairs because we weren't on the front of the balcony having said that it was on the same night as the england euro semi-final match so I did think it might not be quite so busy and quite a few tickets did pop up on Twickets mm. a couple of days before, but whether they sold, I don't know. But obviously some people may have changed priorities and just watched the football instead, but it was still busy. Yeah. I would have expected it to be busy because they don't do that much, do they? No, I mean, they did they do their initial reunion tour last year? Mm. They did a few dates in the UK earlier this year, around March time, I think, maybe three or four. 
And this one was mainly a 2000 Trees warm-up because this was on the Wednesday night and I think they played at Trees on the Thursday and they were the only two UK shows on this run. Yeah. I think the support band did the same. I think they were at Trees. They were, yeah. Yeah. So, next question. Merch. I did not purchase any merch. Well, I know you didn't purchase any, but was there any particular reason? Was it too busy? Uh, Well, it was in the usual merch booth. Yeah. You know, the traditional one. On the left. I had a look in when I went through the doors. There was a bit of a queue. But although they had a couple of cool designs on the front of the merch, there were no tour dates on it. Mm. So that was a bit off-putting. And I do have a Gaslight Anthem t-shirt somewhere, and I can't for the life of me find it. It's one of those mysterious missing ones. Yeah. And there was no prices on the merch either. What? I know. It's funny because I went in on my own and then because my friend couldn't get down for about another half hour or so after I was getting there. So I just waited inside. And I remember standing thinking, he's going to ask me about the merch, isn't he? How much was it? I can't remember. So I had another look on the way out. And yeah, there were no prices on the T-shirts. They're normally kind of stuck on, aren't they? Yeah. Unless they were on the table and I couldn't quite see. But... Well, possibly, yeah. They do some to put them on there. So, no, I didn't purchase any merch and there weren't any dodgy sellers outside either. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so that's a bit of an odd one. In addition to T-shirts, I did see they had some kind of old vinyls. When I say old, I mean like back catalogue vinyls. Yeah. Some of which may have been signed and there were a few other bits and bobs as well. But, yeah, that that was it. Okay. Good selection, but I didn't partake. Is there anything you want to mention before we go on to the support band? Other than it was busy and very football-themed in Rock City. So there was lots of flags everywhere for England because they had been showing all the football games prior to that. Yeah, that's just odd. That never used to happen, did it? No. So the game was at rescue rooms that night instead. So they had the big screen on and all of that. And yeah, interestingly, when they released the set times, it said it was going to be an 11pm curfew, which I was horrified at because normally Wednesday is a 10 o'clock curfew because of the club night. And it said 11, I was like, oh, surely they've done a typo on that. But no, it was definitely an 11pm curfew. (laughs) Although it did actually finish at half 10. But I wonder if they hadn't planned a club night because England were potentially going to be in the semi-final that night. Hence, yeah, probably maybe why it was an unusually... Right finish, yeah. Yeah, that. And also they had the screens on in Rock City. So the screens that when you wait in between bands, they normally advertise upcoming gigs on and club nights and drinks mm. and yada yada they actually showed the band on stage on the screens which i have never in my life seen before oh i've never seen that at rock city maybe it's happened at other gigs and we just haven't been there for them but yeah I was you, really you would have thought though that with like the best part of 30 years going to rock city mm. we would have between us at least one of us would have seen yeah that happen at least once i've always wondered why they don't do it although generally you can kind of see from anywhere anyway and they're not necessarily essential but whether it's something that they've kind of changed or they've done something for the football because they might have had it on those screens as well so they've got some kind of new setup mm. for that i don't know we'll see when we go back to a gig together i suppose at rock city but yeah that was it was just a bit of a shock yeah it's unusual but quite cool mm. Yeah, they look like they've got like a multi-camera setup as well. It wasn't just a camera above the sound desk at the back showing you the stage. Oh, so they got they different angles. They did have different angles as well and close-ups. And... Well, that's cool. Yeah. They should definitely do, keep doing that. That's a great idea, yeah. Hmm. All right, then. Let's talk about the support band. Spanish Love Songs. Yeah, who a friend of mine really, really likes and said, and also wanted to know your opinion, but we've not talked about it yet. So I don't know what you thought about any of the night, really. So, yeah, Spanish Love Songs. First time you've seen them? It was, yeah. And I don't think you're a massive fan from listening to them, were you? Not hugely. Yeah, I'd listened to them. I think I listened when they first got announced to support. And I thought, yeah, they're all right. Mm. And then I listened to them again kind of day before, a couple of days before. And I thought similar. I thought they'd be kind of... One of those bands where if they're at a festival, I'd probably watch them and they'd be really nice to listen to if it was a nice sunny day, quite chilled. Yeah. Have them in the background. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Wouldn't necessarily go out my way to watch them or listen to them. Definitely came across better live. I think they were heavier live. Yeah. But had a really good stage presence, had a lot of interaction with the crowd. There was definitely kind of a little core fan group towards the front that you could see. I kind of got more into them as the set went on. Yeah. And they seemed to pick up as well and get kind of, it's almost like they were warming up as they went. 
Right. So towards the end, whether it was the order of the tracks and particularly the crowd at the front seemed to get more warmed up as it went on as well, they'd probably got some bigger hits that they played later on, which is fairly normal, I guess, anyway. I suppose so, yeah. And with you not kind of knowing much about them and I suppose not really knowing what their biggest songs are, you're not necessarily going to know what's going to do better anyway. Exactly, yeah. So... Yeah, they, they were okay. Again, I'd probably watch them again at a festival. I've not been converted to be a massive fan, but I've seen much worse support bands. Mm. Sound-wise, they sounded great. One thing I've not mentioned, actually, is I didn't have my loops with me. Oh, God, yeah. It was a bit of a mare of a day, really, because I was in, had an office day to start with, which is always annoying. Mm. And then I had to kind of loiter around before the gig. I went to get the tram into town to park, do the park and ride thing, and the trams weren't running for maintenance <laughs> yes. on the tracks. So then I had to get back in the car and go and park and all that. And I forgot to take my loops into the office because I was that busy faffing about with everything else. So I ended up buying some emergency earplugs from Boots, which I didn't realise were like wax crayons. They were the fucking grimmest thing. We've <laughs> still got some for emergencies. I mean, they worked in terms of dulling the sound enough so I wasn't buzzing after in my ears. Yeah. And I could still hear okay-ish. But all oh, the weird things. I mean, they're only about two pound fifty. So what do you expect? I weren't going to buy another pair of loops for the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, sound wise, they they sounded good. Mm. Okay. Did miss a couple of tracks because we nipped down to the toilets partway through, just to know, avoid the queue. Avoid the queue, basically, and try and get back to where we were, which we almost did. Yeah, they were all right. Okay. And I think they were well suited. Is there suitable support? Yeah. Yeah. I think they did about forty minutes. That's not bad for a support which, band. There's only one support band, yeah. which still feels weird because a lot, so many gigs like we go to now, there's, two. there's at least two support bands in there. So it's like, okay, fair enough. But yeah, they, they were all right. Okay. Is the summary. Right then. Let's move on to the Gaslight Anthem. Yes. Let us do that. Mm. How long was the set? It was an hour and 45 minutes. That's a hell of a long set. Yeah, actually. So that. Although uh, we did say in advance that the tickets were quite expensive for Rock City, it kind of justified it with being that kind of length of set. And Brian, when they came on, said, oh, the curfew's at 11, so we need to crack on. Mm. Even though they finished at half ten anyway, but I suppose you could, you've got to allow to clear the stage and whatever, haven't you? So, so yeah, around 45 minutes. It was a good old greatest hits set. One thing not mentioned yet, actually, is where we were actually stood. Yeah. So because it was busy when we went in, we thought, well, go and have a look on the balcony. We thought we could see a bit of a gap, but when we got up there, this was before Spanish Love Songs, mm. there wasn't a gap. So we kind of stood away from the front of the balcony, right in the middle, kind of where the steps go. Where the, the seat yeah. go. So there are a couple of, well, a bit of space there that we stood on. So that was fine. We stood there for Spanish Love Songs. As I say, we nipped the toilet, came back, got roughly back in the same place, and that was fine. And then about three tracks in, the most irritating couple I've ever encountered at a gig squeezed their way in front of us which in itself was fine i'm like okay i can still just see over your heads because i'm on a step but they did not shut the fuck up for the rest of the set i'd have just told them to shut the fuck up and it's like i don't give a shit about keith dancing with whoever last night or all this they were just jabbering on about all sorts of shit and i'm just like why the fuck have you paid best part of 50 quid to stand and talk about keith and his missus seriously but eventually we managed to kind of move up the step and across a bit so that blocked them out mm. But I was just like, you know when you've got a view, but people are bobbing their heads together to talk? Yeah. And I'm just like, hmm, yes. What gets your gig goad? That. Yeah, that does irritate you know the what? shit out of me. I mean. Yeah. And at one point I thought, oh, they've nearly finished the drinks. Maybe they're going to fuck off. But only one of them did. And then they came out with more. And I was like, yes. Do you know what I mean? Like the odd bit of chatter, if you're talking about the band or a song or, oh, I really like this one. Or, you know what I mean? That's acceptable. And the worst bit as well was, this will absolutely apply to nobody, but cared, but yeah. she sounded like fog on leg on oh, under the Jesus head. Jesus Christ. To the point where it could have even been her. This is one of our neighbours, by the way. Sounded like her when she had a wine on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, God. I know. Yeah. Anyway, we, we managed to kind of manoeuvre away enough a couple of tracks later. But yeah, some of our videos, I think you can actually hear her on them. Okay. I know. But anyway... Yeah, they came on to Girls Just Want to Have Fun, as you do. Yeah, okay. Straight into 45, which is one of my favourites. Mm -hmm. And as I've already said, really, it was a good greatest hit set. Lots of the older stuff, lots of my favourites were played. 
I think about five or six tracks from the new album, which I have listened to, although not a lot. Yeah. But I was going to say to you, have they got a new album out? And Yeah, it was. I think it was this year it was released. Yeah, and they played like half a dozen off that. I think so, yeah, yeah. roughly. Yeah, they played six off History Books, six off Handwritten, and five off 59 Sound, which kind of arguably they're I'm kind sure of that, bigger ones. I've seen that on a T-shirt. Is that on a T-shirt you've got? Handwritten is, yeah. It's from that tour, even though I didn't go to that tour. I thought you'd got one that had about 59 on it. No. No? Okay, ignore me enough. Yeah. They did only play one track of Get Hurt, which was their last album before their hiatus, which I was a little bit sad about because I really love that album. But Did they have different band members for that, or is it the same ones? Same ones. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're all... I wonder, you know, sometimes um, I, some bands won't play certain things because it's a time that's not... Yeah. I think part of it is it was kind of their last album before their hiatus, but a lot of it was about Brian's divorce. Oh, right, his first okay. wife said, so that might be that's why. That's probably why, then. Potentially. But, I, yeah, I would arguably say it's kind of their heaviest album. But, you know, they played one off it, which is a track that I love, Red Violin. So that was okay. As I've already mentioned, it was the England semi-final that night. So you could see odd people trying to watch the match. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time. But when Brian came on, he did say, fully appreciate something else is happening tonight, apart from us being on stage, which I don't give a shit about. But if you all want to keep checking your phones, I'll let you off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was quite funny. And one of the guitarists did have an England shirt on. Mm. So yeah, that was quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> they came on about quarter to eight and was it eight o'clock kickoff? Uh, it would have been, yeah. And I think it was around one of the slower tracks off the new album, actually. When England scored their winning goal, a big cheer went around and there was like a scramble and everyone was kind of looking at their phones to see what had happened. I could just about get enough signal to see that we'd scored. Mm. The lad next to me, you couldn't get anything on. So he was trying to look at my phone as well to see who scored. And then like this, was it about the 90th minute or the 89th? It was about the 89th minute. Left it late as always, didn't we? And so then people were just trying to keep on till full time, which went up during Michigan 1975, I think full time went up and another big cheer went around. So that kind of got blurred into Three Lions yeah. being sung for the second time because that happened when we scored as well. Well, so yeah. that was quite funny. So it made for a happy atmosphere in general for anyone who cared about the football at least. And an- another moment actually I just want to mention they played a track called 1930, which is quite an old one. Apparently a fan had requested this. I think she'd messaged the band, and I can't remember exactly what it was like. This was a couple of weeks ago, bearing yeah. in mind. So, you know. Brian said something like, a fan's requested this, but I looked and they weren't even following me on Instagram or Twitter or something. So I was like, well, you know, you could at least follow me if you want me to play a track. But anyway, they played it anyway. Yeah. And as I was walking back to the car park, I overheard someone talking and it was the girl who actually requested the track. Oh, right. <laughs> and she yeah. was just so happy and she got a bit of a sign vinyl, which she was carrying on. And also that was quite funny. Mm. So yeah, they chucked that track in towards the end. And yeah, they didn't do an encore. But finished half an hour early. Well, kind of half an hour yeah. early, but yeah. I'll be honest, I don't like an encore. I'd seen her band just save 10 minutes fucking about and just play me 10 more minutes of music. Exactly. Because I knew they'd finish with Great Expectations on 59 Sound, because that's kind of a, a set thing, really. Yeah. So they kind of played Great Expectations straight into 59 Sound and kind of... And you knew that was, the, that was it. Yeah. And I know Lou, who I was with, was said, I'm going to leave about half an anyway, because she got to get the tram back on her own. So I thought, fair enough. And then as they played 59 Sound, she kind of left. And I was like, well, what else could they play if they... Because they left the stage when that had finished, but the lights didn't come on straight away. Yeah. I'm like, are they going to come back on or do something? So I kind of went downstairs anyway, and I thought, if they do come back on, I'll just watch from down here, then I can get out, get to the car park. But then the lights did came on by the time I got downstairs. Oh, right. So, so you kind of timed it perfectly. Yeah. So I just managed to sneak out before a mad rush. So, yeah. So you had a good time? Did, yeah. Apart from the irritants. Apart from the irritants, yeah. But it was worth going to. Yeah. Good. It's all right, then. It was a... Good present to get you. I can't remember. Was it for your birthday? It was birthday, yeah. Birthday, yeah. There we go. I did all right then. You did. Well done. <laughs> now we're going to start the review section. And the first, well, it's the only album, I think, that we've reviewed this month. And that's the new self-titled album by Madicide. Yeah, it's their debut album, 14 years after they started as a band. Yeah, that's a but, hell of a gap. Yeah. <laughs> Some things are worth waiting for. And a band we really like seen them live before and been really looking forward to this yeah since we saw them in it was april wasn't it at yeah. Metro Fest. 
we knew the album was coming. So it's been great to finally hear it. So should we start off with the first track? Yeah, we have actually spoke about this before. Yeah. And it's Nicotine Love. We reviewed it as a single, I think it was in June. Yeah. And I know I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I loved it, yeah. It's one of my favourites on the album. Same. In fact, I think it is my favourite song on the album. It's quite different to the rest of the album. It's definitely got more kind of grungy groove going on than thrash, I would say. It reminded me more of kind of like Wednesday 13. Yeah. That kind of like really creepy start to it, and then it just gets mm. feels really dirty and sleazy. Yeah. But yeah, still enjoying it, that one. And as we mentioned when we did the single review, it's got a great video as well. But when I was looking on Spotify, it seemed to have disappeared as a single. Yeah, I don't know why that is. No. I don't either, because I thought, I'm sure we, because I knew I'd heard it before, I thought, I'm sure we spoke about that yeah, as a single, and but yeah, it just wasn't shown as a single, so not really sure why. Before we move on to kind of talk about the rest of the album, we've not actually said how many tracks it is, which we normally do for our album yeah. review, so it's officially eight tracks, although there are nine, number nine is a bonus track. Yes. And it's around 40 minutes. Uh-huh. It's track two, The Pit and the Pendulum. It's just a brutal speed track that's so different to the first one. Yeah, it's a complete change of pace, isn't it, when this yeah. one kicks in? Yeah, the, and he's got an absolutely insane kind of guitar solo, which is quite a bit of a mad aside thing anyway. But like guitar mm. solo, like three minutes in, is just yeah. insane. It just comes from nowhere. Yeah, kind of the guitar solos are a pretty much a standard three theme through all of my notes yeah. that I made. But yeah, really good track. It reminded me a lot of very early Metallica, mm. I thought. Yeah, there's a lot of Metallica influence on this. Track three, Ozymandias, another one that I do like. felt this one was quite disjointed, but in a good way, the different kind of paces, changes of tempo in it. Yeah, I've said it's a mixture of stuff like Doom, Hardcore, Thrash. It's got various mm. elements of each kind of different bit. And it's got quite a 70s sound to it as well. Mm, I felt quite a sinister undertone to this one. Yeah, it's really catchy as well. Yeah. Again, this is a standout kind of track for me yeah you mentioned the chorus i thought it was really good the way that kind of shouts yeah and you can imagine that working well live and just kind of the tone and the title all kind of blend in with that kind of sinister Mm. vibe to it track five are keen yellow it's another kind of catchy punk thrash combo but it's also got some really kind of delicate soft guitars in it in places as well Mm. they've kind of mixed they really mix things very clever and it just, the way, it, some things have got just some subtle things in there that you maybe potentially wouldn't know. Yeah, it's a, I think it's the longest track on the album, nearly seven minutes, this one. But definitely, I would say, one of the standouts along with track one. Mm. I just love the way it's got different twists and turns, changes of pace and tempo. It's almost like it's telling this epic tale as it goes through. And it just builds, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I made a note actually about kind of a classic sounding guitar work in the middle, and then it just leaps into like a really shredding solo. Yeah, all hell lets loose, yeah. and it does it. It just goes crazy. Another one of my favourites is Into the Dark. This one just felt more atmospheric, had a really dark feel into it, but still fast and thrashy. And again, another great solo on this one. That's track seven, by the way. I don't think I said that. I actually thought this was slower pace compared to some of the other stuff on the album. I think it is to start with. Yeah. That's what I remember it then kind of builds and it's got fast elements to it. Like a lot of it, it kind of changes pace. And it's got some really interesting kind of warbled vocals on it. Mm, yeah. And it's got quite a 70s feel again to this one. Almost sab- a bit like Sabbath yeah. in places. Track eight, another standout track, is Tommy Knockers, which was another of the singles. And it's like Megadeth meets metallica that kind of sound but it's got a very kind of dark brooding undertone to it you just feel it coming through a lot more of these kind of intense drums and guitar solos going on and it's yes just a really good track yeah i really enjoyed this one as well kind of those sounds that you mentioned like the metallica and the megadass i felt there's kind of hints of horror punk in there as well yeah obviously named after the book and i feel that kind of comes across in the ambience of the song and then as we finish, track nine is actually a bonus track, Death March. Has a really marching rhythm to it, fittingly. Yeah. More fat riffage going on. And then kind of quite slow mid-breakdown and a chant. Again, another one that works really well live. Yeah, it's like an angry kind of fist-pumping, foot-stomping sort of track. And I would have been happy 
with either this or the last track to finish the album. But you know, it, it, this is an absolute treat of a bonus track. I think it's, it works in the context of the album as well. Definitely, some bonus track you think why, but this definitely this, fits it definitely in. Works, it? Yeah, yeah, just a really good way to end it. Yeah, I think overall a really good solid debut. Oh yeah, brilliant. Yeah, loads of classic thrash in there, those hints of 70s. It's just got a nice mix of everything. Yeah, and those sinister undertones through a lot of the tracks, and yeah, works really well overall. So what did you give it? I gave it seven and a half. Oh, I gave it nine. Did you? Mm, I really like this album. I think it's a great debut. Moving on to the singles then, and the first one is Accelerate by Hammer, who are a band we are hoping to see at Bloodstock. They won the... Scotland Metal to the Masses, so they'll be on the New Blood stage at some point over the Bloodstock weekend. This song, I think, is just insane. It's just so ferocious, so heavy. It's got aggression in a good way. It's face meltingly heavy, pounding drums from the start. Yeah. Yeah, my first line is, shit, this is brutal. <laughs> yeah, if you want someone to kick you in the balls, it's this. It's got such an angry kind of snarling vocal. It's incredibly quick drumming and frantic guitars it's just it is non-stop brutal sound for the whole length of the track yeah i can't wait to hear this live this live christ this will wake people up yeah definitely and can't say much more really mm. looking forward to it the next track then is dragged out and it's by the 500 featuring charlie rolf from as everything unfolds yeah we saw the 500 a couple of years ago playing the first ever Mangata. And I've not spotted them doing a lot since then. Yeah, I thought we'd seen them as well. We have, yeah. Mm. But yeah, saw the release for this, so obviously wanted to give it a listen, being fans obviously of the 500 and of, as everything unfolds. Yeah, it's really addictive, this song. Mm. Some really cool heavy riffs in it. The drums are just crushing, and it, the mixture of the vocals, just like the melodic and the screams, I think it's an amazing single. Really, really good. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's really kind of haunting and dark. Obviously, some really poignant lyrics in there. And Charlie's vocal, which I love anyway, but it just works really well and blends really well into the track. And yeah, very, very much enjoyed it. And then the final single that we're going to talk about is the latest one from the Dead 13, who we saw and chatted to at Bloodstock last year. And that's their new track, Stand and Fight. Mm. Yeah, haunting guitars in this. Really powerful vocals, and it's a standout single release, this. Yeah, it's really atmospheric, and it's dark, and it's quite classic and typical of their sound. Yeah. In a good way, obviously. Got some great growly vocals and guitar work in there. Quite an anthemic chorus. Yeah, I've had this on repeat a lot, and I can't wait to hear more. I'm really looking forward to seeing what else they're going to knock out. Yeah, I think it is their first release since we saw them. I think it is, yeah. So, yeah, hopefully more to come from them soon. Mm. So that is the July Roundup. And yeah, we hope you enjoyed listening to that. We are going to be at Bloodstock, and this is the last episode before Bloodstock. Oh gosh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. So you will be able to keep up with us and see who we're chatting to potentially, who we are watching, and everything else that's happening there. And you can do that via Instagram, Threads, and X at Ready to Mosh Cast. We're on Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube at Ready to Mosh. And there's also our Patreon on there, which is just £3 a month. And you get access to bloopers that don't make it into the show, early access to episodes wherever possible. And you can find out what we've got planned before anybody else. And you can also support the podcast for free by giving us a five-star rating and a nice little review on whatever platform you're listening to. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Make it howl, moon.